Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 32. The Reverend Robert Zagor is preaching. The broadcast of chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them and after, and after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yevon, Tebal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripthoth, and Torgamah. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with their own language, by their clans, and in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Raama, and Sab Sabreka. The sons of Raama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and in the land of Shinar, from the land went up into Assyria and built Nineveh, and Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rasin, between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, and Ananim, Lehebim, Nathapalim, Patharisim, Kaluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, and Amorites, and the Gergesites, and the Hevites, and the Archites, and the Sinites, and the Averdites, and the Zemorites, and the Hathathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon into the direction of the Gerar as far as Giza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, and their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the old elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arkashbad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gather, and, and Mash. Arpachshad fathered Selah, and Selah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two more sons. The name of one was Peleg, and in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jorktan. Jorktan fathered Amalad, Shelef, Hazarmeraveth, Jer, Hadamari, Uzal, Dikla, Abel, Ibimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havelah, and Joab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Misha in the direction of Shephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans and the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. This is the word of the Lord. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. The genealogy of the nations. We might be tempted to think that this was something a little different than it's intended to be. As you hear the genealogy of the nations, what you probably think is the origination of nations as we know them, but the Hebrew word there is goyim, the Gentiles. 
This is where the Gentiles came from. And as we trace this through you, hear a lot of familiar names that you're going to be running into over and over within the scripture and outside of the scripture as well. For example, one of the things that really, really got to me when I first understood that this was the case was Yepheth, the son of Noah, has a counterpart in Greek and Roman mythology, Lapheth, which is an exact transliteration and an exact translation of Japheth, and he was one of the titans who founded Greece and Rome and gave birth to the gods, so to speak. You trace them out and you find out that not only do you find that this is a, a good summary of what happened on earth because God gave it to you, but it's actually something that you can investigate and find proof of, not just in DNA charts or whatever else, but in the way that languages have grown throughout the world. You can trace these same lines, these same clans, and that's what a lot of people tend to do. And in doing so, you miss the whole point. Because you see, this is where a great change has occurred. After the flood, the Bible is going to start concentrating on the work of one family, one line. The very next genealogy that you run into is going to be the genealogy of the father of Abraham and the Holy Seed. And that ends with the birth of the Savior of the world. As we trace through the generations and the years, there are a lot of things that happen from nation to nation, place to place, person to person, a lot of history that you can look at. And all of them are meaningless apart from the coming of this one. All of them are absolutely hopeless without the coming of this one because what you find in genealogy after genealogy in the book of Genesis, ten different genealogies, ten different sections with the, with the nations, is that they need a savior. And the hope, the hope of the world is placed among a people that can't be trusted. The hope of the world is put in the hands of a people who cannot get it right. They're never going to be the biggest. They're never going to be the strongest. They're never going to be the wisest. They're never going to be the ones who are mighty hunters before the Lord. They're never going to be the ones who do all of these things that make a name for yourself among people. But God will preserve that line generation after generation after generation. And the knowledge of the Lord from among the Gentiles is going to continue to pop up every once in a while as you're reading through the Old Testament. You'll say, well, where'd that believer come from? Because we tend to think, oh, Israel's the whole ball game." But you find that Moses' father-in-law is a true priest. Abraham runs into Melchizedek, the priest, the priest of Salem, and priest of the true God. There's a line. There's a life. There's a plan. And God executes that plan through the generations. As we look at our days and our deeds, this becomes vitally important for us because we tend to think way too much and way too little of the meaning of our moments. We tend to seek for things that we believe we're losing or can't hold on to without recognizing the flow of the generations is the part of the plan. When I was in my first call, one of the real crises that happened in our little community, the town that my church was sort of in, we were five miles outside of town, was 1,100 people, and they had the first murder that they had had in about 100 years. 
and was the son of my organist. He had been in a bar fight trying to save a, an abused woman from her boyfriend, and the guy shot him. He was missing for the longest time. Then they found him. She kept asking me why, oh why, oh why. And I kept saying, I don't know. How could you know? The meaning was deep and profound at that moment. But it was informed by every other moment of his life. It was informed by the fact that she had raised this boy on her farm, that he had helped build his, fa his father build the house with a handmade sa sawmill that they used to clear the farm that they lived on. And, they, and mom and dad would live in that house that they built with their own two hands and with their son's labor until the day of their deaths. And it would live on beyond that. It would reach back to the days in the old German settlement when she would, she would have her brother pump the organ pedals with his hands. And she would play because her feet were too, or her legs were too short to actually reach the pedals to play because she was the only one who knew how to play the keyboard and she was 11 years old. It would reach to the meaning of what it meant to have a father and to have a father who wasn't strong enough to save you from death. It would reach into the life of every single family in the community. And when I came back to visit that place 20 years later, they still talked about it. We tend to make every moment about us. But it's not. Every life, every moment touches a hundred others, a thousand others, a million others. All part of a plan, all part of a design that ends with you meeting your Father in heaven face to face. That ends with you meeting your brother in heaven face to face that meets with you hearing the words of the Holy Spirit, spoken, not written, but spoken for the first time, going into your own ears as you stand before the throne upon the glassy sea, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, gloriously making music before the Lord, and seeing those who stand before you in such glorious array that if you were to see them on earth, you, like John the Apostle in the book of Revelation, would be tempted to fall down on your knees and worship them. And it goes through so many places that don't seem fit for so great a task. We're used to the stories being writ large so that you can tell that great events are happening. We might be tempted to look and see if Magog really is attacking the sons of Canaan here as we look at the battle of Russia and Ukraine and so on. But the real story is about Christ attacking death and how he's the one who was the ultimate goal of all of these lineages, that one might be born of a woman, born under the law, to save those who are born under the law. That he, your brother, of your holy line might know your name and your face, save you, and give you eternal life.
and mark you among the heirs of that great and glorious gift, a holy bequest, the will of the Father given only and executed only upon the death of the testator. We're going into the final two weeks of Lent. Does Lent really mean that we're just simply supposed to look at ourselves? Even if we're just saying how bad we are. Oh, I'm really bad. I need to give up chocolate. I'm not against doing it. It just seems a little less than it's called for. Oh, I'm really bad. Look at me. I can't do anything right. And there is a point to that. But there's a greater point still. This son of Noah would go to the cross. This son of God would go to the cross. This your line, your family, and your hope. Born into a family that can't get anything right. We'll get everything right for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. In Jesus' name, amen.